food and I'm pleasured, I'm excited to be interviewing Professor J. Scott Christensen. He's for people that are up on blockchain and up on distance education, you know, he's one of the most well-regarded uh, experts in the area. You know, he runs out of uh, Missouri and he does webinars on the technologies um, involving around blockchain, Bitcoin, and has been well established in the industry for quite some time. So I'm real excited to have him on. So I saw, thought today that we would jump right into discussions that he's very well um, spending a lot of time on these days as we all are uh, distance education. So professor, it seems that with COVID things have been moved along that much quicker um, in the direction of distance education and distance learning, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah, by leaps and bounds, I would say that we may have been to this point 10 or 20 years from now, but we're here now. And some of this is not going to change when our campuses reopen because we're finding that, frankly, some courses can be online. We're also finding that some students do really well online, and we're finding that we can offer more opportunities to our students if we don't just force them to only be in a classroom. And we're seeing that across the board. So if you look at online grocery delivery, that was like 1% of the market in February. It's now 20%. I don't think we're going back. My mom does not want to ever step foot in a grocery store again. She's 89 years old. She's figured out how to order her stuff from the local grocery store, and I don't think she's going back. So I think this has really accelerated the changes in education, healthcare, and supply chain in a big way. So I know that you have many business school students and students that are specific to business. Are you seeing like a lot of transitioning going, making use of the blockchain or companies essentially going online and having to adapt to the new reality that we're experiencing? Yeah, so I think supply chain is a great example. Here's something that's very, very paper intensive, is very much old school, even though we've had containers for a while and big ships, that's kind of been the last big invention in this area in some ways. And so if we start to look at not only traceability, so putting things in a blockchain where I can tell that this bottle of wine, the, where the grapes came from, or more importantly, that this lunch meat I have has been refrigerated all the way through the supply chain and it's not going to cause a listeria outbreak or something, God forbid, like that. But uh, we're also going to see smart contracts. So right now it's fairly complicated. If I want to sell widgets, a million dollars of widgets to somebody in Brazil and I don't know them, well, they have to go to their bank, get a letter of credit, talk to them, that bank to my bank, and then my banker calls me and we pay all those banks in between. But instead I can say, well, I'm going to, you escrow your money in a smart contract. I'll ship my widgets. When you drive out of the uh, dock with the uh, widgets, then that executes and I get my million dollars, right? So uh, I think it's exposed some of these fields like supply chain that have been somewhat stagnant. They've used some technology, but it's generally been kind of linear. You know, this got a little bit better, this got a little bit better, this got a little bit better. And now we're seeing some real breakthrough technologies that people are looking at. So I think blockchain will be a big part of that. And it's interesting to see what companies that you would associate with being low tech that are starting to use it. Like um, I know they're tracking wines, they're tracking diamonds, especially pieces of fine art so they can find like the provenances along the way. Do you see this being like a part of every industry where they're tracking like everything through RFID chips and it's like a large scale introduction of this? Yeah, and I think that it'll also help us conform to some government regulations. So, for example, in the U.S., there are new requirements for how you track drugs through the supply chain. Of course, here in the U.S., we've been going through and are still going through an opioid epidemic, and this came out of the prescription drugs. And so now we really want to know how are these things being transferred through a blockchain. We don't need to know that Scott is taking this particular drug. Right. So that's the nice thing about blockchains is they can be anonymous. But we would like to know if Scott's, you know, somehow getting 50 prescriptions a day of this drug, that might be a good thing to know. And so there's all sorts of ways that uh, drug companies are having to conform with this. I think we're going to see that more with food security. Um, and what's really neat is something that uh, you mentioned before we got on the air here, and that is how do you combine these technologies? So how do you combine AI with blockchain? Because we tend to think of them, you know, in these little different pockets, but really the power of AI is being able to look at patterns and 
do predictions. So if we are recording these types of things on a blockchain, well, then that's a great place to stick an AI on it and say, well, what is going to be the demand for peanuts next spring? Or what is going to, is there a way that we could reorient this supply chain so it's more efficient to do some fancy word we call disintermediation in management, which means just get out the middleman, right? So is there some middleman that we can avoid here? So I'm really excited about how do we combine these technologies. But you're also really thinking about some innovative ways that AI can play into education in the form of like academic records and like helping students find out where they ultimately should or would do the best in terms of college, even copyscapes, and then long term, you know, um, spinning, you know, articles. Do you see AI like playing a big role in education going forward? Yeah, and it's one that I am generally optimistic about, but I'm also a little bit worried about because there are student goals. And to be frank, uh, and I work at a major research one university, some of the institutional goals are not always aligned with those, right? So we want to uh, be considered to be um, world class and high ranking. Well, one of the ways we do that is we turn away students, right? And so there was quite a scandal a number of years ago where a number of colleges bought the SAT results just so that they could encourage those high level people to apply and then they could deny them entry right in order to say oh well we reject a high level of you know applicants that have this score or better i'm really kind of worried because sometimes uh, we could see an ai being used for admissions or we could use it for why don't we just have ai grade my papers so that way i can have 3000 students submit essays well that might work for some stuff you know the next mark twain or truman capote is going to get an f because they're going to not comply with the previous way of writing. And so I think um, we really have to step back a little bit and decide where do we want human judgment and where are some ways that we can really use AI. I'll just mention very quickly um, AI and medicine with radiology, pathology, that's going to change those industries, even cardiology, in some very big ways and a very positive ways for us as well. Um, there's a great book that uh, your students might want to check out or uh, anybody might want to check out called Deep Medicine. And it's all about how AI is being used in medicine. Yeah, I mean, it seems like every area is at least in some way being touched by blockchain and the ability of a decentralized ledger to hold information more reliably or more honestly than some, you know, back servers and the use cases and applicability just becomes like more readily apparent, you know, with each com company that tries to move the needle and advance the technology. You also see blockchain interfacing with like government with property records, and you think that it can do a lot better with accounting and some other areas, right? Yeah, so I always tell my students about the time I got audited when I was running my own business. And they said, oh, well, you're going to have a sales tax audit. I thought, oh, that's fine. I have everything in my QuickBooks here. I'll just turn over a flash drive with my QuickBooks. This will take about five minutes. It took three months because they wanted to have, you know, all my bank records and they want to reconcile that with all the checks I got from customers because they said, Scott, well, we don't know that you didn't bill Rob for $10,000 pocket five, then go and alter your records and say that you only build them for five. And uh, I had, not, that was the first time I realized that <laughs> uh, that was a big part of it. But the, imagine a blockchain where all this is immutably entered into the record. We can obviously, if there's an error, we can do a journal entry and correct it as we have this append only ledger. But my bank is signing that transaction. Rob is signing a transaction when he trans transfers money in. And so we could eliminate that reconciliation of records. And so if you look at the big four accounting firms, they all have major blockchain efforts going on right now. And some of it is around this area of accounting, traditional accounting. Some of it's around like, how do you manage property rights to digital assets? Okay. Uh, software licensing, licensing to use music, that sort of thing. You know, I've actually had a couple of YouTube videos that have gotten dinged because I used some iStock, you know, photos or videos. Well, I had paid for those. Being able to have some sort of ledger that that could be looked up on and say, hey, Scott does really own that. 
having some sort of like database that can, yeah, essentially be pulled from, um, because I think of the existing databases for music and certainly a lot of intellectual property is behind either a paywall or some sort of person that would be providing information. So the accessibility opening up to everyone. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting way to go. But I, I know that in my own discussions that from small businesses growing law costs, costs of getting contracts looked through with the fine tooth comb. And if you can have a smart contract that's been verified, tested, and the wiggle room is almost nil, like I think that would be valuable to both parties that um, either a binary event happens or doesn't happen. But in terms of like a smart contract, if, if someone came to you and said, how is a smart contract different than a regular contract? How would you kind of break it down? Well, it kind of de depends on what type of smart contract you're talking about, but often these things can execute without any type of human intervention. So that example I gave you with the widgets, let's say that I have failed to uh, make my car payment. Well, once again, we're combining with different technologies. So there's other technology called Internet of Things, where my car can have a little microprocessor and the Ford can say, don't turn that guy's car on. You didn't pay up. And then I get online and I pay up online and then it immediately executes that. The other really interesting thing that uh, relates to this, though, um, is online dispute resolution. So being able to bring this disputes regarding contracts uh, online. And there's a couple people, uh, I, I can never pronounce the name, Clarios, I believe is the name. It's from South um, uh, America, uh, I think in Argentina. And they are looking at this as how do you have jurors vote and record those votes on a blockchain and look at resolving that dispute through this decentralized network of jurors. And so if I contract to make a website for you. And then you say, well, I, I'm not going to pay. That's a horrible looking website. Uh, then we would have these jurors actually look at it and on a blockchain make their votes as to whether, well, you know, Rob didn't really say what he wanted on the, the website and he did kind of make a website. So we're going to award a certain portion of the contract. And so uh, being able to do that and being able to do that with people that are not necessarily lawyers could be very cheap compared to current dispute resolution processes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that the discussion that I get that people reach out to me, uh, you know, from a news article or whatever, and they say, what's the future of blockchain for governance, not decentralized governments, but like actual government, you know, when are we going to see votes? When are we going to see things that are traditionally done by hand, you know, done by computers? And that's a scary thing because we hear about the hacks, we hear about the ways that the blockchain can be obfuscated in some way or rolled back. But when you're talking about big projects like Bitcoin or that sort of thing, it, are, are the hacks regular or is that something that's not that much of a consideration at the present time? Um, well, uh, I'm not an expert in all areas of this, but certainly there's theoretical hacks. Some of these do come into play when you get into weird little altcoins uh, that are maybe not set up um, that well or haven't been examined. The code hasn't been examined that well. By and large, I would say that most of what we see is someone duping you into giving you their private key or doing something like that. So it's really more of having people that are not educated as to how this really works and what they need to protect. So um, they might fall for some scam. Send me your private key and I will send you some Bitcoin. Well, of course, no, I got your private key. Now I'm going to send me some Bitcoin, right? I don't think there's as big of an issue with security. It is interesting you mentioned voting and we're recording this at a time when we're about to have, uh, I think we're having an election, this, some, something like that coming up. <laughs> the, um, there's Tusk um, Philanthropies has put forward this um, blockchain voting app and they originally used this for overseas military personnel. And it turns out it's really hard to get your ballot overseas, get it notarized, get it back on time. Yeah. And they actually did this on a blockchain. And it's really fascinating. I, I talked with them and they let me go in and actually look at the, the blockchain that they were using. You could audit it. They also had to build in special things in their protocol for a spoiling a ballot. So let's say that I um, vote and I go, oh, darn. Um, I voted for the wrong thing and I can go back at my polling location and spoil my ballot and get a new one. And so they have a protocol that takes the last vote that Scott did 
for this candidate and it puts that as what gets counted. So I had to do some different protocol uh, adjustments there, but it has been used in several municipal elections. And I think we could see a day that this might be used worldwide. Yeah. I mean, the, the applicability there, I think that's really powerful. I know that so many governments are integrating it into their currencies, like, you know, the digital yen. And then I know in the, the Caribbean, there's all sorts of uses yeah. for the payment rails. You know, we've seen just such growth with smart contracts leading the way with the DeFi and, you know, how that is making a huge splash into the world of finance. But I think that for students that are, you know, looking at this interview, if they want to know more about you. I know you have a really compelling newsletter, uh, frt.news. And uh, I glanced through that uh, earlier and uh, I look, look forward to, you know, diving in more because I know that everyone that I speak with about it say that your knowledge about this runs so deep. So I think that's a great resource for students that are looking for Internet of Things, which a lot of people hear IoT, but it's really, would you say the connectivity of devices or how would you break that down? Well, uh, certainly, you know, when we talk about precision farming, smart cities, all that, what we're really talking about is putting a small microprocessors to monitor things and to take action and often combined with AI as well. So being able to actually take uh, action automatically. Now, one of the things that I've really gotten into with my students is that some of this Internet of Things is volume small little microprocessors. So I have one here. It's called an Arduino. And the uh, original Arduino would be quite large, but this is a company out of Cincinnati that has miniaturized all this stuff. And this is actually from a student project where they made a stethoscope for simulations. So if I'm an actor and you're a medical student and you are interviewing me and I say, oh, you know, I don't, I don't feel very good. And, you know, my tummy hurts and all this other stuff. And you get out your stethoscope. Well, I can't really fake, you know, a heart valve problem. But this was a little thing that they did and it would actually make katunk, katunk, katink, katink, you know, make these different noises with the little RFID sensors that were on the person's shirt. And this is something that, you know, you could do for $100. I call it copy and paste hardware because you don't have to know everything about it. You can find some guy that made a um, and shared out how to make a sound and some other guy that shared out how to sense something. And you can actually build things and real businesses. I have one student that um, built this Internet of Things device for cattle. She received over $120,000 of pitch money competition. It wasn't the final product, but we call it a proof of concept. And she could actually show that she could do what she wanted to do. And it was just copy and paste. And so uh, when it comes to Internet of Things, I just get, I just geek out about that kind of stuff. So I just get, I get too excited about it. And I, I forget all this discussion about smart cities and smart farming and all that. I just want to play with little stuff. It's so exciting with the technology that, like you say, you can build out, you know, fairly quickly, cheap and dirty um, working model of what you want to do um, for a lot of these technologies. And the line between education, academic and market is sometimes blurred and it just, you know, it takes off in no time. So that's an example of taking things directly to cattle and something that farmers can really use in a meaningful way. And that yeah. can have a transformative effect on the industry. Yeah, and we always talk to our students about this models of Porter's five forces, you know, in business and all this. And I always say, look, you know, the barriers to entry are lowering. It, you don't have to wait to start your business. OK, you don't have to wait to do this. And she's still a vet student. She's running her business as well. And she didn't wait. And so get started now. And whether it's with blockchain, artificial intelligence, IoT, whatever it is, do it now. Yeah. And I think that what a lot of people feel like it's coming at them so quickly. So you have learnabout.ai where you kind of walk people through and say what exactly is going on as far as what you're seeing. And then that's like a good resource. And then what popular mechanics and like, how do you find like what's coming in terms of AI? Yeah, there's a lot of... Um conferences. I was actually attending a, a conference in Riyadh um, from my basement here <laughs> this past week, and it was all about AI for social good or AI for global good. And there's about 20,000 people, I think, that were attending remotely. And so this COVID has helped us in some ways that I couldn't afford to fly to Riyadh or take off the time. Uh, but I have to, of course, I have to get up at five in the morning to uh, Get the, get the conference because of the time difference. But there's a, lots of opportunities out there. There's lots of local groups, lots of interest groups. I know certainly around Bitcoin and, and blockchain, there's a lot of developers in, in any major city. 
yeah, so I, I, there's just a plethora of resources out there. Um, yeah, you know, wherever you are, I think that the access to even these uh, meetups uh, for whatever your specialized interest is, you know, now with everyone being virtual, you can, you don't have to be limited by your geographics. Yeah, in, in terms of information, check out that newsletter, check out that site. And I really appreciate having you as a guest today. And um, I think that we'll be hearing a lot more in terms of AI in the future and I'm excited to hear your commentary on it in the future as well. Oh, well, thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed it.